Google Earth, this I th picture of, is a picture, I think, of, this is a picture of Caltech taken from an airplane, I think, that I got off the web, but right there is where I work in the LA basin um, at Caltech. So what I'm going to start out with today is a, an outline of what I want to accomplish in this talk, because I, I, I'm going to present a lot of information, and so I want you to understand where I'm going with it before I... Uh, start showing you pictures. I'm going to talk about the, the emerging um, area of modeling of macromolecular complexes um, and, and neuroinformatics, mo modeling of macromolecular complexes in synapses. Um, and I'm going to talk at first about what we need to know about biochemical signaling in spines. We, we focus in, in my lab now on uh, postsynaptic spines, which are the postsynaptic side of excitatory synapses in the brain. Um, those are the synapses that are most plastic when we learn and remember. And so the biochemical mechanisms of that plasticity are a subject of great interest, and they're also very uh, complex. Um, so through the lens of trying to understand what synaptic rules of, might be of spike timing dependent synaptic plasticity, I'm going to talk about the kinds of biochemical data and biochemical simulations um, that we, we are building and need to build in the future um, and will need to database or share uh, with, with the rest of the community. Um, so the, a central question from my point of view in understanding spike timing dependent synaptic plasticity is to understand how the biochemical apparatus in the spine responds to rapid fluctuations in calcium, um, which are the initial signaling events that produce synaptic plasticity. Um, so there are biochemical responses to the amplitude of the calcium transient, as you can imagine, but there also um, is a sensitivity of, on, of the biochemical machinery to the frequency of calcium transients, the frequency with which the calcium rises and falls uh, inside the spine. Um, so I'll also talk some about the role of the structure and arrangement of signaling enzyme complexes in the spine. Um, Biochemists uh, for many, many years have done their studies on individual uh, proteins or mixes, mixtures of proteins in a test tube um, where, the, the, by definition, uh, the, the enzymes are in solution and well mixed. Um, in the spine and in, in, indeed in, in most um, cells, enzymes are scaffolded and arranged uh, spatially and receive their uh, triggering signals um, in, a, in a spatially uh, relevant way, and that has to be taken into account ultimately uh, in, in building a model. So I'm going to put in green here the, the kinds of things that eventually will, will need to be accessible in databases and vetted by a large number of people um, in, in order to improve the, continue to improve the accuracy of the kinds of simulations that I'll talk about. One of them is certainly the stoichiometry of proteins and the postsynaptic density. How many of different kinds of proteins are there? Uh, and and um, in addition, a mesoscale understanding of the arrangements of protein complexes. And by that I mean uh, an understanding of their structure on a scale that's larger than the atomic scale, but smaller than, than the scale of, say, half a micron. We need to understand how different protein complexes are formed, um, how it, whether or not they're dynamic within the synapses, how they stick together, where they stick together, how they compete with each other. Um, and then finally, they, of course, we will eventually need to understand the relative prevalence of different signaling complexes at different synaptic types. There's been a great deal of attention uh, focused um, in, in my field on understanding the postsynaptic excitatory synapse because it's tractable and, and it's helpful that lots of people are working on it. But there are different synaptic types in the brain, and we need to understand how they vary in order to get a, a, a much more precise sense than we now have of the rules for synaptic plasticity and, and, and how synapses change as we learn. Um, so then I'll, I'll, I'll finish by talking about the, the uh, efforts that we're making to understand the kinetic properties of the biochemical signaling network. Now, what do I mean by that? In, in, in biochemistry, the notion of biochemical kinetics was very um, uh, popular and at the forefront of biochemistry um, in the 50s and 60s and sort of went out of fashion with the, quote, molecular genetics revolution um, when much of the molecular study of cells 
uh, was not didn't need to be particularly quantitative. We spent a long time gathering uh, information about the characters involved um, in, in a, the individual proteins involved in a particular biochemical network, but didn't have a need to understand how many, how fast, uh, under what circumstances does which enzyme is rate limiting, for example, in a complex process. Um, but now that we're trying to understand how cells work, how these molecules, since we're nearly finished gathering the, the, the characters, how, the, how they work within the neuron, um, or within any cell, we have to come back to the issue of, of biochemical kinetics and sort of revive this field and, of course, breathe new life into it with um, the wonderful computer-based tools that we have available to us now. Um, but that means understanding kinetic rate constants for the binding of molecules and enzymatic reactions, and, and uh, those need to be accessible and vetted and present in databases. Uh, and it means constructing accurate and um, well-tested against experiments um, kinetic models of biochemical signaling networks. So there are two um, ways, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, two, two major ways of, of building a kinetic model. One uh, that's commonly used is a compartmental reaction diffusion model, which means uh, building differential equations um, and placing the reactions that are modeled by these differential equations within little compartments in the cell. Um, for a, a, a compartment as small as the spine, what we've found is that spatially accurate stochastic models are a much better representation or, or a much more accurate way of representing um, the, the, uh, the kinetics of biochemical reactions in the spine. And I'll, uh, at the end, I'll show you how we're using a program called MCell in collaboration with the Sanofsky Lab to begin to construct such models. Uh, and I'll finish with an animation of a simulation made in this program, M-cell, of the, of the calcium fluxes in a spine during synaptic activity. It, this, is, this is a bit of candy after this, what I'm, I'm maybe a rather dry uh, talk. Okay, so the, the, the areas that, that my lab has been most interested in and that I'll highlight a little bit during the talk is understanding the stoichiometry of proteins and the postsynaptic density. How many of these different proteins are there really? It's not really, it, the, the postsynaptic density, which is a scaffold of signaling enzymes in the spine, um, is not simply a bunch of enzymes all stuck together randomly. It's quite, it, it has quite a, a, a regular structure. Um, that, that I and others are, are uh, working on understanding now. And then also, um, as I mentioned, my lab is uh, make, building spatially accurate stochastic models. And so I'll focus on um, some of our work in that area you know, through the lens of this uh, question of how does spike timing dependent synaptic plasticity work. Okay, so this background should be familiar to most of you who are neuroscientists. I hope it is because I'm going to go through it rather quickly. Um, Quickly, this is my clock. Um, so in the uh, neocortex and the hippocampus, mechanisms of synaptic plasticity that underlie memory storage are classically called long-term potentiation, LTP, and long-term depression, LTD. I'm sure that most of you know that. Uh, the direction of plastic change at a synapse, that is whether a given um, bout of activity produces LTP or LTD, um, is in most instances determined by the precise timing between the release of transmitter, the release of glutamate, and the firing of the postsynaptic neuron, which, or, and or depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron. Um, so that's what's referred to as spike timing dependent plasticity. Um, both types of plasticity are triggered by an influx of calcium through NMDA receptors. There, that, the NMDA receptor is the, uh, the initial mediator or, or filter through which spike timing dependent plasticity occurs. But the determining parameters for the biochemistry that happens in the cell are the ampl amplitude and frequency of the calcium influx through that, that open flickering uh, NMDA receptor. So this is uh, a diagram, a visual diagram from a review by uh, Sasha Nelson that, that illustrates this point. I don't, can you still hear me when I turn my head like this? Sometimes if you turn away from the microphone, you can't. So um, this represents the, the, the level and of uh, rise in calcium. And the, speaking qualitatively, 
the field generally agrees that a, a, rel, a, a low level, a, low, a, a small increase, relatively small increase in um, calcium inside the spine produces long-term depression, and a, a, a um, larger increase produces LTP. Now, the NMDA receptor uh, acts as a filter, that, which means that um, low frequency stimulation produces this low rise in calcium and LTD. Higher frequency stimulation uh, sends more calcium faster through the NMDA receptor and so tends to produce LTP. Similarly, um, uh, if you look at spike timing, when the postsynaptic uh, neuron is, depol is depolarized, is this post before? Yeah, slightly before the presynaptic terminal releases glutamate, you might get a small increase in calcium, which would produce LTD, but if it's if the presynaptic neuron fires before the postsynaptic neuron, you get a large increase in calcium and are, are, tend to produce um, LTP. So, synaptic firing at 5 hertz produces LTD. Um, synaptic firing around 50 to 100 hertz produces LTP. Uh, and similarly, we have this 20 millisecond window in which um, if you shift the pre- and postsynaptic firing, you change from LTD to LTP. So this raises some pretty interesting uh, biochemical questions. What are the protein targets of calcium coming through the NMDA receptor that produce the, these changes in the strength of the synapse depending on uh, the, the timing and flux of calcium? And how are they organized to achieve the kind of exquisite sensitivity to the timing and amplitude of calcium flux that I just showed you? Um, this, this is a pretty sensitively tuned biochemical system, uh, and so an interesting one to try to think about from a kinetic point of view. So we know from decades of study that a large number of interacting biochemical pathways can regulate LTP and LTD. Indeed, nearly everyone we know about can be shown in one way or another to have an influence on um, uh, synaptic plasticity in one way or another. But a smaller number of calcium sensitive pathways we know can trigger um, LTP and LTD. Um, so uh, a final bit of background that I need to give you is that most forms of LTP and LTD involve two major structural changes in the postsynaptic spine. One of them is the addition of ampatite glutamate receptors or the removal of ampatite uh, glutamate receptors um, from the postsynaptic membrane. This, of course, um, produces the higher or lower um, EPSP that's produced at the synapse each time it fires. And also, uh, con uh, concurrent with this uh, process of adding or removing receptors is an enlargement or a shrinkage of the spine head that's mediated by changes in the actin cytoskeleton. So the kinds of biochemical mechanisms that we want to look at are mechanisms that would influence one of these two uh, biochemical processes. So um, this is meant to scare people. Um, this is a rough map. That was a joke. Um, it's a rough map that's deduced from physiological studies coupled with pharmacological and molecular biology studies over the last couple of decades. Um, and it shows uh, the various kinds of interactions among known and reasonably well understood biochemical pathways that can influence um, events within the synapse. Now, the, the, I'm going to simplify this in just a second, but the, here's the NMDA receptor with the rise in calcium, and here are some of the early targets of calcium coming through the NMDA receptor. One major target is a small molecule called calmodulin, which in turn binds to and regulates a number of other known molecules um, in the spine and indeed in lots of, of cells. Um, CAM kinase 2, calcium calmodulin-dependent protein kinase 2, um, can influence, actually through a large series of reactions not shown here and not terribly well understood, can influence both the strength of existing AMPA receptors and addition of new AMPA receptors. Um, what we actually understand a little bit better, though, is how uh, the NMDA receptor acting through CAM kinase 2 um, can influence pathways that lead to changes in actin polymerization, um, which... Uh, which lead to the growth of the shrinkage of the spine. So um, these NMDA, I'll just say parenthetically, these NMDA receptor to actin pathways are the pathways that we are experimentally studying in my lab right now. Um, however, the core uh, uh, calcium pathway is calcium to calmodulin 
to RAS GRIF, which activates RAS, to CAM kinase 2, and to calcineurin, a calcium sensitive protein phosphatase, which leads to dephosphorylation um, of, of uh, a number of, of different proteins. So the field has developed a hypothesis which says that competition between CAM kinase 2 and calcineurin for uh, calmodulin is what determines ultimately whether the, the, the spine uh, undergoes LTP or LTD. You get more CAM kinase 2 activated, you see LTP. You get more calcineurin activated, you see LTD. This is an experimentally based uh, hypothesis um, that recognizes a couple of experimental findings. Um, one is that high and rapid calcium influx through the NMDA receptor does activate CAM kinase 2 very strongly, and inhibition of CAM kinase 2 in a wide variety of ways blocks the induction of LTP. Um, calcineurin, in contrast, has a tenfold higher affinity for calcium and calmodulin than, than does CAM K2. So one would imagine. Um, in the simplest circumstance, certainly in a test tube, that a lower increase in calcium might uh, activate more calcineurin than CAMK2 uh, relative to a higher increase in calcium. And indeed, uh, inhibition of calcineurin blocks induction of LTD. Um, so an explanation that's been put forward is that this competition between these two molecules um, for uh, calcium and calmodulin is, is the source of the sensitivity to calcium in, in, in spike timing dependent uh, plasticity. And we'd like to test that uh, hypothesis by thinking, it, by thinking it through really in a much more quantitatively disciplined way, which, which we can do now. Um, a problem with, with that hypothesis on the surface is that it refers to or, or, or is drawn from studies um, done at equilibrium and often done at saturating calcium concentrations, whereas what's being responded to in the spine is fluctuating calcium, frequently not saturating either, either activation of CAM kinase 2 or calcineurin. Um, and so what we're working with the Sanowski lab to do is um, build a kinetic model um, in which we'll just ask the question, given our knowledge of this system, of, of everything about that we know about binding of calcium to calmodulin, calmodulin to CAM kinase 2 and calmodulin to calcineurin, and given what we know about calcium handling in the spine, um, uh, can, can, would we predict that, that uh, conditions that generate LTP will activate, in fact, a much higher ratio of CAM kinase compared to calcineurin? And um, so in building this model, we're forced to ask a lot of very precise questions about these two um, uh, enzymes and their regulation in the spine that we just haven't had to ask before. Uh, one of those questions is how are they arranged and how many of them are there? Uh, so this is just a, I, I took this picture with a new electron microscope we developed that sees in color. That's, that's another joke. Um, this, I don't know if you can see, is, are the lights, can you see this all right? This is a cartoon that, that I made with, that superimposes as, to, as well to scale as, as I could do it um, uh, ensembles of atomic level structures of the various proteins that we, we know exist in some amount or another um, at the postsynaptic density. So the blue guys represent NMDA receptors. We know that NMDA receptors, unlike AMPA receptors, which are shown here, have these long tails that stick down into the cytosol and uh, nucleate the formation of signaling complexes. We know nothing about the structure of that tail, so this is really just a fiction. We know its approximate size, but we don't know its structure. Um, associated with that tail are a number of scaffolding proteins. This is PSD95 here, which is a, a fundamental scaffold um, that, that assembles uh, and, and holds together various signaling enzymes. Um, see if I can see. Oh, this is PSD95. This is Syngap, which is a gap protein that, that is activated by calcium and inactivates RAS. Figures very highly in this system, improbably, but it does, and I'm not going to tell you that story. Um, these are representations of Schenck and Homer and um, metabotropic glutamate receptors studied by um, Morgan Sheng and Paul Worley and a number of, uh, of other biochemists. 
This is a, rep a representation of cam kinase 2. We know that at least some cam kinase 2 sticks right to the tail of the NMDA receptor, and so is held, uh, at least some of it, rather tightly uh, against the NMDA receptor, and it's kind of right underneath, um, uh, therefore, the, this ca the calcium channel. Uh, but th this kind of cartoon is the best we can do to, to, at the moment to begin to, to uh, improve our intuition about how these machines might work. This is a little easier to see. Uh, it's a, a similar um, cartoon, and it shows uh, cam kinase 2, which is a dodecamer of 12 catalytic subunits, each of which can bind a molecule of calmodulin and is activated and has kinase activity. Uh, and then it shows calcineurin, which is um, uh, generally um, a, a mono, has a monomeric catalytic subunit with a small um, uh, regulatory protein, and then calmodulin binds in addition and activates it. Calcineurin can be scaffolded in the postsynaptic density um, by uh, ACAP79 and by a protein called uh, Yotiao. So there are, pro there are scaffolding proteins that can immobilize it in the postsynaptic density. What we don't know for sure is how many calcineurins are there and exactly where that scaffold is located. Um, now, uh, if, if we think hard about data that we've already gathered and do a few more studies, um, we come up with this table of the stoichiometry of some of these, these critical uh, calcium regulatory proteins that I've just mentioned to you. Um, and, and this is a kind of surprising table. So the best kind of median estimate for the number of proteins in a half micron diameter spine head. Um, this is actually in the whole spine head, not just in the postsynaptic density. Some of these will be immobilized in the density, others will likely be spread throughout the spine head, but it's a very small compartment. Um, you see that there are a lot of CAM kinase 2 holoenzymes. CAM kinase 2 is a uh, about 1% of the protein in the forebrain. It's, it can be thought of really as a specialized product in the forebrain. It's mu at much higher concentration than protein kinases are generally expressed in, in, in most cells. So there's just a lot of it there. Uh, and that means three, um, about 3,000 catalytic subunits on average. So varying, this, is, this is a very generous variation. Calcineurin, on the other hand, is present at the concentrations that are more typical of, of kinases and phosphatases, regulatory enzymes. So there's only about 27 molecules of calcineurin with the, this small variation. Calmodulin um, is present at about uh, 2,000 copies with this possible variation. Now, this data is actually present and quite well done, as a matter of fact, in biochemical measurements uh, we, we converted the multigrams of protein per kilogram of tissue and then calculated the, these numbers. Um, and, and we combined those numbers with later immunocytochemical measurements that um, sh say if a protein is concentrated in one place or another so that we adjust for that concentration as well as we can. Um, the numbers in the literature are quite good. In general, um, because they were done in the 1980s, um, People don't know about this. People, they, it, they haven't thought about the, the fact that there are such different numbers of, that, that these proteins aren't all there together in the same amounts. Um, so our models will have to take into account the fact that there's really not a lot of calcineurin there um, compared to CAM kinase 2. It is a very rapid enzyme and very, very, it has a high turnover number and it's sensitive to calcium. Um, but in addition to that, more than likely, calmodulin is not able to completely saturate this system. And so it shows, again, thinking about it in another way, that these, t the, these two enzymes compete, uh, calcineurin and cam kinase 2, as well as other calmodulin binding proteins, compete for what is almost certainly a limiting amount of calmodulin as calcium flows into the, um, to the, the uh, postsynaptic spine and binds to calmodulin and makes it active. Um, so this, this is uh, a system that's functioning in, in a dynamic range. It's not at equilibrium, um, and has to, so the kinetics have to be handled uh, with that fact in mind. Um, I put, by the way, green lines underneath, as I go through the, these slides, underneath the things that I think need to be the aspects of these models that will need to be put in databases and available to everyone and vetted by people as they uh, continue to refine the numbers. Um, so, uh, 
I'm just going to list here some other individuals who are developing methodologies that are computationally rich and, and are, are really beautiful approaches to deciphering the structure and the arrangement of signaling complexes in general. Most of these techniques have not yet been applied in the neuron, but they're very powerful. They've been applied to other um, cellular systems. In particular, um, Andre Shali, who is a uh, professor at UCSF, uh, um, University of California at San Francisco in the United States, um, has developed computer-based modeling of protein complexes that, that, um, in which he can take information from a very wide variety of biochemical and physiological techniques, apply constraints, and um, come up with a minimum, optimum set of uh, possible models. And he's used this with his group recently to uh, construct a really quite successful model of the nuclear pore complex, which is a, 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 um, a, certainly as complicated as the postsynaptic density uh, and, and has uh, equally um, or almost equally uh, highly regulated functions. He'll be a, he and others are beginning to apply these kinds of techniques to the postsynaptic density complex. Carol Robinson at Cambridge in, in uh, the UK um, has developed mass spectrometry of very large protein complexes and she's able to deduce the substructure of complexes as they fragment in this instrument. So this is a very useful way of testing the notion that a few, a few proteins form one stable complex and then a few more come together to form a larger complex. It's an additional set of information that will allow us, <coughs> it, when applied to the postsynaptic density, to understand its construction a little bit better. Um, Gina Terigiano at Brandeis um, uh, University in the United States who's done a lot of nice work on um, homeostatic regulation in neurons, <clears throat> has a new uh, project in which she's working with others at Brandeis to use um, nanomolar resolution fluorescence microscopy. It's a, it's a, a kind of um, photon-assistant light microscopy um, to determine neighbor relationships in vivo, in, in cells, in synapses. And she, so she's beginning to apply this to the postsynaptic density neurons, and it'll also allow her to... Um, uh, deduce information about changes in those neighbor relationships upon stimulation. So this will give us a sense of the dynamics um, of, of changes in those complexes. And then, um, I think it's Ed Moore, but I wasn't sure about the first name, um, at University of British Columbia in Canada, um, has developed really nice quantitative fluorescence co-localization using standardized immunocytochemistry, again, uh, with the light microscope, so that <clears throat> these kinds of um, uh, techniques can be used to, to uh, create constraints on uh, information about protein complexes that can be used, for example, in Andre Chalet's uh, modeling experiments uh, to, to further constrain our notions about how these complexes are built. So there's a tremendous amount of what I'll call computationally rich um, data that's about to emerge about protein complexes that needs to be shared and understood and, and, uh, and vetted in databases. Um, okay, so now I'm going to shift to a discussion of um, how to model the kinetics of biochemical reactions in a spine. And just These are general um, considerations. I won't have time, certainly, to go through a detailed model, but I, can, I, I will be able to tell you where to go if, if you're interested in understanding these methods better. Um, so I, I mentioned to you that much of biochemical kinetics um, is measured and understood uh, and studied um, in test tubes uh, in which the molecules are <clears throat> generally freely diffusing uh, and well mixed. Um, and in fact, these methods can be used to get good rate constants, both on and off rate constants for binding reactions as well as uh, affinities, which are the, the ratio of those two. Um, however, to actually model uh, how these molecules behave in a cell, um, you ha the, the, the spatial arrangement is very different. And so the uh, um, assumptions that underlie, for example, michaelis menten kinetics of well-mixed uh, systems and large numbers, large average numbers of molecules don't necessarily hold. So, for example, this is a cartoon of a spine in which we know that lots of the targets of calmodulin are stuck up and immobile um, underneath the source of calcium, which is kind of raining down from the top. Um, so that's very different than the situation in a test tube. Fortunately, in the, the in M cell, the program I'm about to tell you about. Um, one can use 
probabilities to model the, the, the kinetics of these interactions that are derived from the on and off rates that are measured in a test tube. Um, there's a, a, a simple relationship that, that, that gives you relative probabilities of interaction that can be translated into a model that's more, um, more stochastic or prob probabilistic, um, as shown there. <clears throat> okay, so the, the bottom line is that the critical calcium regulatory events, that, the kinetic regulatory events that determine LTP and LTD operate under non-equilibrium conditions. The calcium is fluctuating. Uh, and not saturating, so it's not at equilibrium at the time that LTP or LTD are induced. <clears throat> and it's occurring in an environment that's not well mixed. So uh, I'm just going to summarize. This, I'm going through this rather fast, I know. But the point of this is to, to uh, get across the notion that <clears throat> compartmental modeling um, which involves differential equations and uh, uses average numbers like the concentration of a given protein or molecule um, are not really adequate for a situation as such as occurs in the spine. We need stochastic kinetic models that take into account the spatial organization of proteins and that include non-equilibrium kinetics. So calcium, calmodulin, and its protein targets <clears throat> are not well mixed. The protein targets of calcium are bound to scaffold proteins in the spine. The concentration of calcium at, at the critical times that we're interested in is below, usually below saturation, and it's fluctuating quite rapidly. Uh, and the concentration of calmodulin, as I showed you, is roughly equal to the concentrations of its protein targets. And so it won't be able to saturate any of them. Um, it's working at below saturating conditions. So competition for calmodulin will be critical. <clears throat> the, um, the program that we've been working with, Terry Sanofsky, and uh, Tom Bartol, who's one of the developers, really, of this program, who's now in Terry's lab, um, Terry Sanofsky's lab, uh, is called MCEL. And, and to do the kind of modeling that we want to do, which is modeling of biochemical reactions inside the, the space of the spine, um, the, the original MCEL program has been modified uh, uh, quite dramatically so that we can model both surface events, surface binding events, ion fluxes through, through fluctuating channels that are opening and closing. Um, and we can model interactions between diffusing molecules uh, in, the, in the cytosol. So this is called M-cell 3. <clears throat> the underlying um, mathematics should actually be out in, in SIAM by now. It's been accepted in its, in a, to be in a special issue of SIAM, and I, it, it, should, it should have been out uh, already. Uh, so, so this will be a, a, a key um, uh, paper explaining the underlying algorithms um, that we're now using with, with M-cell. Um, now, to, to, uh, before I get into this diagram, I want, I'm going to say uh, Tom Bartol and people in Terry Sanofsky's lab have been working on a model of a spine that incorporates real geometry, which they got from uh, work of Kristen Harris, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and they, they've, they've modeled the location of NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors and proper stochastic kinetics of those receptors. They've modeled um, the uh, outflux of calcium from the spine through sodium and, and uh, pota sodium calcium exchangers and, and ATP-driven uh, calcium pumps. And I will show you a simulation of that model. Um, at the end. That'll be the animation that I told you was pretty to look at. Um, what we're doing is not, at, at, right at the moment is building kinetic models of the interactions between calcium, calmodulin, calcineurin, and cam kinase 2 that we will place inside those spines once we're satisfied with our models. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go through just what those models look like and how we develop them. Um, and the numbers that we have to either find in the literature or more often measure. One, one of the advantages, actually, of, going, of doing modeling if you're an experimentalist is that if you can't find a number in the literature, you go measure it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not hard for us. And, and, and I've discovered that many theoreticians have a hard time getting over that leap of just going and making the measurement. We, we don't, because this is what I've done all my life. So we have actually been able to, to, to gather an enormous amount of uh, fundamental parametric information about these complicated systems. So th here's an example. 
of a kinetic diagram of the interactions of calcium with calmodulin. So this is CAM0, no calcium bound. One calcium at the C terminus, two calciums at the C terminus, uh, an additional one at the N terminus, two at the N terminus. So that's fully bound CAM4, or, or CAM with four calciums bound to it. The, the dominant interaction with targets occurs with calcium with four bound to it. So, so the, all the down arrows represent the interactions with the target, CAM kinase 2, which is the K there. The dominant interactions are with two bound at the C terminus and with two bound uh, at, at, with four bound at both termini. But in, when we're modeling non-equilibrium kinetics, we really do need to understand or model in, at least in some circumstances, um, all of these interactions, all of the binding of, of uh, calcium to calmodulin and then the binding of these various species of calmodulin to CAM kinase. So this is just the, the initial diagram, which can be then uh, um, translated if we want for, to, for measurements in a test tube into differential equations or into probabilities for the M cell simulations. Um, here is just a part of the, the, the okay, good, of the parameter, um, I'll just be able to show the movie and then we'll be done, of the, of the uh, parameter table that we've assembled. This is about half of it. Um, that, and e so each of these parameters is either gotten from a particular reference and vetted, and, it, and there's a range here. They're all the, the, the affinities and the K-on and the K-off rates. Some of them we've measured ourselves because we had to. Um, so here's an example of the kinds of things that need to go in a database and, and need to be shared around the world because some of those uh, will, be, that will make a big difference in the outcome of the simulation. Some won't matter, some will make a big difference. Okay, so in building an M cell, this is to prepare you for this animation. In building an M cell simulation, you make a physical model in the computer a mesh, and, 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 and you will see in this, the, the animation I'm about to show you was made by Tom Bartol, um, and he's worked with, with uh, Kristen Harris to um, build these physical models of a spine, so he's very proud of them, so you'll see a lot of that in the simulation. And you, you put them in the, into the computer as a, as a mesh, uh, a framework. Um, you then place the molecules in space within the model in the computer simulation, and there's a whole set of algorithms to do that. You add probabilities of binding, channel openings, enzymatic reactions that can be calculated or derived from the solution rate constants that you measure in a test tube. You choose what output you want, visual or numerical. Um, there's a large range of things you can gather from a simulation. You run it. Um, the diffusion of molecules is modeled as a pseudo-random walk. A ray tracing algorithm is used to determine collisions. Um, and then the collisions trigger reactions or state changes of the molecules according to the probabilities that are measured uh, um, in, in, a, in a test tube, the, the turnover numbers um, or, or the activation rates. Okay, so here's the movie. Um, you're going to first see um, a, a diagram of the, can you see this all right actually with all the lights? Well, actually you can see that of course. The, there, yeah. So that's a five by five um, uh, micron cube of Neuropil um, made by Kristen Harris with serial EM sections. The green are axons, the blue are glial cells, and the yellow are dendrites. And he's going to show you different parts of it as the movie progresses. It's it's pretty short, so I'm essentially done. So there's the glial cells in that five micron process. I mean five uh, micron cube. Um, now he's coming back to the dendrites. There's two major dendrites, and he'll show you those separately. They're kind of crushed in with each other. He really likes these meshes. Um, so uh, there's one of the dendrites, and you can see the spines. And then there's a larger one um, that will come up in a minute, and he'll also show in red um, the postsynaptic densities that, that were uh, outlined by uh, Kristen Harris's group in, in, as they segmented the, the serial EMs. Oh, yeah, th and there are also internal membranes, which you're about to see here. Um, ER, the red, I believe, are long mitochondria, and there are a few blue-green uh, peroxisomes. 
I don't know how to shorten this part of the movie because it's not exactly what I want to show, but it's nice. Okay, now we'll go to the bigger spine. Or bigger dendrite, excuse me. So that so this is a big dendrite lying next to the somewhat smaller caliber dendrite. And he'll show the membranes inside that one. Some ER, uh, long mitochondria. Um, that's inside the, the larger dendrite. And then we'll get down to the synapse, which is the point of the, of the simulation. So what this illustrates is, is that you can put into the computer very spatially realistic meshes upon which you can hang molecules, add molecules, and, and t t uh, tag them with appropriate kinetics before you do the simulation. So there are the spines with the red uh, postsynaptic densities. Here's one green axon, and he'll f now focus in on the spine that, uh, where you will see the behavior of calcium ion during a brief uh, single release of glutamate onto that spine. Okay, so there's the synapse. Green is the axon, and, and the, of course, the yellow spine is the sp spine. Single impulse, yeah. So um, this shows the positioning of the NMDA receptors. They're the blue guys. And the AMPA receptors, there are more of them in this particular spine. Um, so there are the receptors. Now this, so, so he slowed it way down. This is one millisecond of glutamate release. The glutamate release happens really fast, and the AMPA receptors activate quite fast. The NMDA receptors activate much more slowly, so you won't see them coming on in this short one millisecond animation. You'll see that later at, when he expands the animation to 100 milliseconds. But this, this, is, this is how precisely it can be simulated if you choose to do so. This, this comes from, of course, biophysical measurements of the behaviors of the channels. All right, now he's going to show that same activation event over 100 milliseconds, and what you're going to see is the, the, the behavior of free calcium inside the, the cell. Now, free means free unbound calcium. So here's the calcium extruders. The, that went by pretty fast. This is... Um, Calcium binding proteins. So he's got calbindin in here. You can't see those, can you? All right, can you see that little, there's a few free calcium floating around. That's a proxy for total calcium. There's a lot more total calcium. All right, there's the release. There's the 100 milliseconds. And you'll begin, to, I hope you can see it. I don't know if you can. There's, you'll begin to see little shots of increases in free calcium, which, are, which represent calcium coming through the flickering NMDA receptors. So there's You'll see a concentration up here and then a concentration down there, and it goes up and down uh, and fluctuates. So what we will eventually do is add the targets um, for calcium and calmodulin into this simulation and ask how they compete given the, the numbers that we have. So that's the, that's the potential for the future. Um, Okay, so this is work that, uh, as I said, was, has been done uh, in collaboration with a group at the Salk. Um, uh, led by Terry Sanofsky, um, and a group at, in my lab, um, the names shown here, Stefan Mihalis, Tammy kinzer Ursum, Shirley Pepke, and Santiago Lombeda. Kristen has uh, been very generous with us in, in providing the, the um, segmented uh, serial sections. Joel Stiles is a co-author of M-Cell. He works at University of Pittsburgh, and he and Tom do the development uh, of M-Cell together. Um, I haven't shown you work in which that we've had that we've done in order to gather some of our parameters that was done in collaboration with Steve Mayo and, and done by these individuals in my lab. Um, the funding has been um, by the U.S. N uh, National Institute of Neurological Diseases and Stroke, and some by NSF and some by the Howard Hughes Foundation. But more recently, the Gordon and Betty Moore uh, Center for Integrative Study of Cell Regulation at Caltech has enabled us to begin uh, building a, a um, GUI front end, as it's called, a graphical user interface front end for M-Cell, and tools that will make it, we hope, much more accessible to the community. It's a difficult program to use, as it is now, because you have to write in a meta language. Um, but we're building a front end that will help sort of guide people through the creation of the models with that meta language. Um, so I think I'll stop there and, and uh, take any questions that there might be.
So maybe I should leave that up. I'm sorry, you drone that calcium uh, comes from uh, upside, but uh, you have ER and metapro metabotropic synapses. They release probably calcium right. from ER. So, so you take it in. Right. So the um, the first the, the first bit that we want to simulate is really the first couple of seconds after activation of NMDA receptors. Um, th there's a limit to what we can model and test experimentally in an accurate fashion. Um, so this, the, the 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 models that we will be building initially will not. Uh, draw upon the ER calcium or the metabotropic uh, receptors. The, the re I remind you that the initial triggering of LTP or LTD depends upon the activation of the NMDA receptors. It can be modulated by glutamate receptors. That's a slower process. We hope we can add that in eventually, but we are not at the moment trying to model everything. We can't do that accurately. Yeah, but there could be a possibility that they have all, also very fast component, so it could be more dynamic. If we can't model what people observe, given what we know and think is happening, then we will know that we need to add in additional elements. That's actually part, part of the point. Yeah, in cerebellum there are data. Right, yeah. exactly, of course. I have a question. Uh, in the morphology, uh, glutamate axons you can uh, uh, identify by the vesicular glutamate transporter one, two, or three. Mm -hmm. The one is mostly on spines with asymmetric synapses. The VGLU2 is more, or it has some symmetric synapses. Mm -hmm. And both in the subcortex and the cortex, you have both VGLU1 and 2, mm -hmm. although probably the VGLU2 more on the shaft, mm -hmm. not on the spines. Mm -hmm. Can you speculate on the release probability or, you know, how it uh, would change or so build in that complex? Th there's a project that I didn't talk about in the Sanofsky lab that Tom Bartol is working on to model the, the behavior of glutamate and its release and uptake in the extracellular space. And that, that wasn't part of the simulation that I showed you. It's amenable to exactly the same kind of modeling experiments, and they, are, they have and are doing such projects. I'm not knowledgeable enough about their findings to give you an answer. But it is, it is absolutely amenable to the same kinds of, of, uh, of modeling. Are there any other comments and questions? So if not, thank you once again for this fascinating tour through the...